A four minute miler is never going to run a five hour marathon. Does the data ever lie? The data can lie. I think in terms of development, what do you need to develop to become a better runner? The runners that tend to be the most successful are the runners that just fall in love with training hard. I like to see runners hit a couple equivalent performances before they go for the big goal. Let's go for that sub three attempt now. I think you're ready now, Andrew. I don't think we should wait. Wait, hold on. Are you, are you my coach now, Jason? What's going on here? I sat down with legendary coach Jason Fitzgerald of strength running fame, and I picked his brain about all things coaching. How does he get runners faster? What's his intake process like? How does he write plans? Does he adjust his style to different types of runners? We talk lifetime miles, we talk slow twitch versus fast twitch, and we almost make it the entire video without saying the words double threshold. If any part of this interview sparks joy, please consider subscribing. Enjoy. Okay, now Jason, I do have a side quest for this conversation and it's to try to go through the whole thing without saying the words double threshold. That might be, that might be hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, th I think we could do it. Okay, now let's say a runner comes to you and they wanna run a marathon and hypothetically, they have a goal of a sub three hour marathon. Now, what does that assessment process look like for you? Because you've got to take them from point A to point B, which is their goal. So what does that intake process look like? Well, you mentioned earlier that you're hoping to run a sub three marathon. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Let's just do it with you right now. All right, Andrew, you're in the hot seat then. See, this is hard, you know, you get you get a podcast host on a podcast and he, he turns the, the whole show into the <laughs> in, into being the host himself. Okay, so what is your current marathon PR? Uh, it's a 302.24 in the Houston Marathon. Okay, so you're in the ballpark. It's not like you've run 348 and all of a sudden you want to have a magical 49-minute PR. What is your half marathon personal best? It's a 123.58. Okay, so the first thing that I would say is you're ready for a sub three marathon because your current marathon time is close enough and your half marathon time indicates that you have the fitness level, the talent, the ability to go run a sub three marathon. You just need to put the training together and then great race execution on race day. You know, I like to see runners hit a couple equivalent performances before they go for the big goal of running a sub three marathon. These equivalent PRs are basically performances that are at an equivalent level of competitiveness. So a three hour marathon in my mind is very similar to an 85 minute half marathon. It's also similar to a 5k in about 18, 15, maybe 38 or 38, 30 in the 10k. You're probably ready to go run 85 minutes in the half in a sub three marathon if you do the requisite training. So what I would say is let's go for that sub three attempt now. I think you're ready now, Andrew. I don't think we should wait. I don't think we need another season of you becoming a better runner before your marathon season. I mean, if you say we can do it now. So let's take a step back. If, you're, if you were a little bit further away, maybe you would run an 87 minute half in a 305, 306 marathon. I would say let's spend three or four months running a couple 5Ks, a couple 10Ks, and one or two half marathons. You just have like an eight week period where you might run five or six races. And the goal is to get those race times down to the level of equivalent performances of that sub three marathon. But I don't think you need that. You can go right into a marathon season. So the intake is really like, where are you now? Where would you like to be? How long do I think might it take you to get there? Okay, Jason Fitzgerald, how do you get runners faster? Like not just like in a marathon build. I know a lot of runners probably come up to you. They've signed up for a marathon three or four months from now, and then they want to coach with the plan to go along with it. But like, what if I signed up for a marathon in nine months and I come up to you and I say, Jason Fitzgerald of strength running, <laughs> I want to get faster. How do you get me faster? Another huge question, I love it. So if we use this example of a runner having a race on the schedule in nine months, I think it's always helpful to think of, of these big blocks of time as cyclical seasons, right? Sort of like if you were a university runner, you are gonna be running a cross country season, an indoor track season, an outdoor track season, 
and then your summer is going to be base training before cross country starts. It's always helpful to think about these as little cycles because running is always cyclical, right? You start with some easy running and then you build the volume and intensity. And then you enter the competitive phase of training where you're doing your harder workouts. You're starting to run tune up races. And then you get into the peaking phase of your training where these are your most important races. You'll taper, you'll run your goal race. Then you'll have a period of rest and recovery where four to 14 days, you might not run at all. And then you start that cycle all over again. Then you get back into some easy running, you rebuild your mileage, your intensity, and the whole process starts again. That, that's the general broad strokes of every single season. And we can do that over and over and over and over again. In fact, that's what runners should be doing all the time. Just constantly going through season after season. So in a nine month time period, I would probably block, uh, block this out into two roughly equal seasons of maybe four months at a time, you know, 18 weeks per season, maybe with a week off in between. The second season is going to be for whatever that goal race is that you might have already scheduled, whether it's a marathon, half marathon, 5k, it doesn't matter what it is. The season beforehand is where we can get a little creative. If it's not your primary goal, if, you're re if your end goal is that race nine months from now, we have flexibility. If that primary goal race is a marathon, I might look at the athlete and say, okay, is this athlete a little bit more advanced? Um, you know, they're comfortable running 40 to 50 miles a week. They have some of those equivalent race performances like we talked about earlier that indicate they're likely to accomplish their goal. If that's the case, I might say, Let's do a speed season. Let's focus on middle distance races, maybe up to the 10K, and really just try to get fast. Let's keep driving down our performances in any, any distance race. It almost doesn't matter. Because if you're becoming a better runner, because you just ran a faster mile time than you ever have before, or a two mile, 3K, 5K, 8K, almost doesn't matter. Better runners are going to run faster races. A four minute miler is never going to run a five hour marathon. They're really good. They're a four minute miler. So they just have to do a couple 20 mile runs and they're, they're good to go. They're gonna run a pretty decent marathon. And so the same thing with some of these shorter distances. Let's get you pretty fast in these races and then you're gonna do well in, in the marathon. Uh, if you're maybe a beginner runner and you don't have comfort with some of those higher mileage levels, you haven't really achieved very much in the shorter distances, maybe because you haven't really focused on them, which I find is often the case. Then I would say, well, because you're training for a marathon in nine months, we really need to boost your endurance because as a newer runner, that's the thing you lack the most because you just have less running experience, right? So instead of a speed oriented phase of training first, let's do a big base phase of training. Generally speaking, it's about what are your weaknesses? How can we work on them? And then how, how can we break up the time that we have into coherent seasons so that you're always working on something, but you're not working so hard all the time that you're gonna get burned out or overtrained or potentially risk an injury. Wow. Okay. I find it interesting that you approach it through the lens of experience versus, I don't know, like slow twitch versus fast twitch. I've been going down that rabbit hole lately. Like, oh, which, which one am I? Oh, I'm slow twitch. And then I saw this other video. It says, if you're slow twitch mostly, then you should lean on your strengths and then just touch a little bit on speed work. And I was thinking the opposite. Like, oh, I, I got to do a lot of fast twitch because that's my weakness and improve it. But really, the best angle should have maybe been experience. If I've only been running a couple of years, maybe I would most benefit from high volume mileage, building more of an aerobic base and getting faster that way, you know? So, but where do you stand on the fast twitch versus slow twitch thing? It, it's such an interesting topic because, you know, on the one hand, I, I don't really think it's necessary to start labeling yourself. I'm a slow twitch runner versus I'm a fast twitch runner. With all the coaches I've had, the formal experience in, you know, collegiate cross country and track, all of the physiologists and PTs and coaches I've talked to on my podcast, nobody really pays attention to your muscle fiber type. This is like the nerdiest physiologists arguing with other physiologists about what workout and how it impacts your muscle fiber types. It's just not really how running coaches really think about the training process. So 
I think it's kind of a waste of time. It, it's probably splitting hairs because ultimately it's just like any coach who works with you for a fair amount of time is going to start to discover what you respond to. So there are some runners who respond more to volume and mileage and tempo runs. And then there's some runners who respond more to speed work and VO2 max stuff and lots of races leading up to their, their goal race. And so we could probably split those runners up into slow twitch versus fast twitch people, but you're never actually going to know unless you get into a lab and have this stuff tested. And, and even then it's like, well, why don't you test your lactate threshold instead? And then after lactate threshold, I'd love to know your VO2 max but your muscle fiber type, it's like, I, I don't really care about that. You know, like it might change the, the pattern of workouts a little bit to more favor one type over the other, but ultimately it's, you know, what are your weak links and how do we address those so that they don't take you out of the game? I'm a very big heart rate guy, almost to a fault, right? So I believe that heart rate is a reflection or a mirror of the effort that I'm putting out. However, as it's been pointed out to me that maybe I allow the heart rate to dictate a little too much or affect my running when it comes to race day performance. But then that would mean that my heart rate uh, is not a true reflection of my effort. So my question to you is, does the data ever lie? The data can lie, but if you have a good heart rate monitor, heart rate data is usually pretty reliable. If you're using a chest strap or an armband, then that heart rate metric is usually pretty solid. If you're using a wrist-based heart rate monitor, you know, like I've got the Koros Apex 2 Pro on my wrist right now. It has a wrist-based sensor. It's hilariously off. Like it, it's kind of a joke. I will go for an easy run and it'll record a heart rate that I can't hit when I'm doing VO2 max work. So first and foremost, let's make sure we have the right equipment to measure the metrics that we want to measure. But even with heart rate, it can, it can sometimes lead you astray. So here's a good example. I was sick for a couple weeks in February. I had a little bit of a fever. I took a couple days off running, but then I developed this cough and I had a cough for like three weeks. It got so bad that I, I felt like I might've strained an intercostal muscle in my ribs. And so it felt like my entire rib cage was in a little bit of a vice. It just hurt to take in a deep breath. And I noticed for like two weeks, my heart rate on my runs was much higher than it usually was. This is likely a reflection of me recovering from an illness and the fact that, you know, my breathing was constrained. I knew that, you know, while my heart rate was higher, my breathing was relatively low. You know, I was kind of struggling a little bit more, but I felt, I didn't feel the same way globally as I normally would have at those heart rates. So I think that's one example of where your heart rate can lead you astray a little bit. Another good example is, let's say you wanna do a, an easy recovery run. You wear your heart rate monitor so that your heart rate doesn't go above a certain level, right? You're gonna keep yourself honest on this recovery run. Well, if you've been training in the heat and then you go running at, at six in the morning, it's super cool out, it's dry, cool and crisp, and you're wearing that heart rate monitor and you're running a lot on downhill terrain, you're gonna be able to run a lot faster at a lower heart rate in that kind of environment, that may not be the best recovery run for you. Even at that lower heart rate, you're gonna be incurring more mechanical stress. There's gonna be more impact force, a little bit more pounding on your joints and muscles and bones. And so, yeah, the, the other thing that I'll say is I wouldn't use heart rate for every kind of workout. I would use heart rate, especially, I think the two best workouts are your recovery runs, to keep you honest, to keep you from running too fast. And then of course, um, lactate threshold, which, which is sort of a percentage of your max heart rate. It's roughly 85 to 90% of your maximum. Okay, now you've coached many runners to a PB or a PR, right? And I'm sure some of your runners have fallen short of their goal. Can you identify common denominator characteristics from your successful runners? I think the most common one is just a, a love and a passion for the work. They don't just want the result, they want the process. They wanna work hard, they like building mileage, they like doing hard workouts, you know, they like doing the cross training and the strength training and all the other aspects of things that a lot of runners like to skip. They're just really 
engaged with the whole process of training and they're they're just passionate about the sport you know they, they love to learn uh, they have fun working hard you know I have a lot of runners that not that they don't want to work hard or they don't like to but it, it's an extra stress and when training gets dense you know when they're doing two workouts a week and a long run and then they're doubling one day with a cross training session and they've got to get to the gym for their two weightlifting days it's like wow there's a lot of moving parts now in my training and i find that stressful you know they they just sort of like to run easy four days a week and do one workout and that was it so the runners that tend to be the most successful are the runners that just fall in love with training hard with with the process of going through the training process. The the person who's going to walk the farthest is going to be the one who just loves walking, not the person who, you know, really wants to get to the destination. I think I'm completely butchering some quote I heard years ago, but if you can fall in love with the process, you're going to be the best runner you can be. Now, as a coach, I'm sure you have plenty of training plans available for people who are looking to run a 4-hour marathon, a 3-hour marathon or whatever the case like a stock plan, but for personal clients who hire you as a coach, do you write out your plans like week to week uh, and make adjustments based on what happened the week prior or how does that work out? I will generally with my private clients create a six week training plan, but of course it gets edited, revised, updated whenever the athlete really needs it. I found that weekly updates usually aren't necessary just because most runners aren't dramatically changing their schedule or or the demands on their time too much on a week to week basis. For the most part, it's it's a four to six week plan that I will write and then update as needed. Do you find that you have to adjust your coaching style for different runners, like maybe older runners versus younger runners An older runner won't be able to handle as much speed work? Or is it like the demands of the race are as such and you have to run these paces in order to hit your goal? A little bit of both. So yes, of course, I will modify my approach for the athlete. You know, older runners are gonna have a different approach than a 25 year old. You know, a 25 year old is drunk on testosterone. They can handle a lot. They probably don't have a lot of uh, family that they know about. <laughs> so, you know, they can, they can devote a lot of time to their training. They can recover from their training really well, absorb hard workouts better. So yeah, I mean, by age, uh, even by, even by sex, I mean, it's been shown that women tend to respond a little bit better to strength, power, speed, and men tend to respond a little bit better to volume and endurance work. I've had Stacey Sims on the Strength Running Podcast. She's fantastic. One of her famous lines is women are not just small men. And so we can't just treat them, you know, as, as miniature versions of us. And that's, I think, very illuminating because our physiologies are different. We respond differently to different types of stress. So there's going to be a slight difference in how I might structure training for an older woman versus a younger man. But you know, that all is within the context of my overall training philosophy. You know, I believe in high volume, whatever that means for you. So, you know, if, if you're not ready to run 50 miles a week, I'm not going to give you 50 miles a week and say, well, those are the demands of the race. I'm going to say, well, let's do the best we can with the time that we have available. We might bridge the gap with cross training. I'm probably going to prescribe, no matter who you are and what you're training for, a fair amount of threshold or tempo work. I think that's the workout that keeps on giving. And it's, it's a capacity building workout rather than a workout that helps you utilize your current fitness more efficiently. Instead, it just builds more fitness, right? You know, I feel like that that meme, uh, that Star Wars meme, and he's just screaming more, more. So I'm generally screaming more when it comes to volume and aerobic work, but it's, it's not all mileage. It can be cross training with the understanding that it's better if it's mileage. I'm gonna have you warm up dynamically before every run. I'm going to prescribe some core and strength routines to, to keep you healthy. So there's some things that I do with every runner that I think are developmental, fundamental, are helpful no matter what. But then it's like I'm, I'm cautious with the things that could potentially hurt you. The speed work, the long runs, the overall mileage. Let's make, let's make sure we're being strategic with that. But then the things that, that aren't going to negatively impact you, 
you know, cross training, that's probably not going to hurt you. If you're doing some cycling or pool running, warming up or doing some extra strength training, that doesn't have any drawbacks. So there's a lot of things that, that I like to do, but I don't really have a template that I follow. It, it's more my overall training philosophy modified for every runner. Now, I don't have a second side quest to avoid using the word lifetime miles. That's kind of been buzzing around lately. So I do, I do want to bring that up. Are lifetime miles just another way of saying running experience? And if so, like how do lifetime miles play a role in your assessment process when you factor in taking in a new runner? Lifetime miles definitely helps because it, 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 it's very much related to the concept of your training age. So if you've only been running for two years, your training age is two. You know, my training age is 26. So I've just done a lot. I've experienced a lot. And when I'm talking to an athlete, I like to say, how much are you currently running? And then like, what's your history with running mileage? You're currently running, say, 30 miles a week. What has been your all-time maximum weekly mileage number? When did you hit that? What kind of peak do you usually get to when you're training for an endurance event? Like let's say a half marathon or a marathon, because you might have 20 years of experience, but you haven't run for the last five years, or you've only been running a couple times a week for the last couple years. You know, when I write a custom training plan for an athlete, one of the questions I ask is what types of running workouts have you been doing in the last four to six weeks? And I'm very intentional with that question because sometimes I'll have runners say, oh, I haven't been doing any workouts in the last couple months, but you know, last year, these are the workouts that I have run. And so that tells me a little bit about, okay, we can get back to this level, but you haven't been doing it in months and months and months. We have to start at a more developmental stage and sort of gradually progress you. So lifetime miles can can be helpful. It can sort of influence the rate of increase or progression with your training. If you've been running for 10 years and you know maybe you haven't been doing a lot in the last couple of months, but you're getting back into it, as long as we're doing things safely, I think that the training can accelerate at a faster pace because of your lifetime miles. Very cool. Now, as a beginning runner four years ago, I would not buy any new super shoes and I would not even consider getting a coach. That was for like, those are things for fast people. And I was just running around my neighborhood trying not to get COVID, right? So as an experienced coach and one with a very successful presence online, you have a wide variety of runners. I imagine like what percentage of runners do you get are beginners? What percentage are intermediate and what percentage are advanced? I, I see a wide variety of runners. I coach probably an equal percentage of beginners, intermediate runners, and more advanced runners. You know, I, I do think that the opposite ends of the spectrum are probably better suited to coaching than maybe the middle. As a new runner, learning as much as you can, as early as you can in your running journey, I think is one of the best ways to set yourself off on the right foot and the right trajectory. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the more advanced runner. You know, you've got the runner who, you know, maybe has been eyeing that sub three marathon for a very long time, and they can't seem to get there. They've run 304 to 301, like four times, and, and they're just right on the cusp. You've got to hire a coach. A coach is going to be able to look at your training with fresh eyes and give you that objective look at, here's some things you're doing great. Here's some things we're not going to do anymore. And here's some things we're going to subtly change. Your training might not even look that much different for the first couple of weeks, but it should, over the course of a couple of months, start to take on a life of its own. You're doing all new workouts. Maybe you're training at a, at a level or capacity than you never have before. And that really leads the more advanced runner down this path of continued progress and continued improvement. And of course, you know, like uh, my bias is the fact that I'm a running coach. As a runner, I've had more than 10 coaches myself. I always had a coach for the first eight years of my running career when I ran cross country and track in high school and college. So I'm very pro coach. I think coaches are fantastic. And if you think about it, anytime you have wanted to learn a new skill, you know, let's say you pick up a guitar or you want to maybe make a, a bowl and get into pottery. Well, what do you do? You take a class, you go hire a tutor, but it's weird that 
With running, we all think we can do it by ourselves. And so we don't hire the coach. We don't hire that outside help. And it usually leads us to either not accomplishing our goal or just taking a lot longer to accomplish that goal. All right, if you think that I should hire Jason Fitzgerald as my running coach, please let me know in the comments. Metaspeed Edge Paris, that's the next video I'm gonna release. It's next week as I take a break from these interviews. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch.